A Story of Creation We have arrived at a plausible story of creation. We can now connect the causeless abstract entities, logic, truth, and numbers, with a viable cause for our perceptions of a physical reality. Why does anything exist? Because necessity requires logical laws. Logical laws imply incontrovertible truth. Such truth includes mathematical truth. Mathematical truth defines numbers. Numbers possess number relations. Number relations imply equations. Equations define computable relations. Computable relations define all computations. All computations include algorithmically generated observers. And these observers experience apparent physical realities. Ancient Anticipations This account of how eternal mathematical truths could give rise to contingent physical truths depended on recent discoveries. It required a deep understanding of modern ideas, universal equations, computers, computation, virtual reality, and simulation. Only a century ago, we didn't even have words for these concepts. Despite this, a few ancient thinkers gave theories for existence that are eerily similar to this modern creation story. They postulated something primal and simple that gave rise to the numbers, and from numbers arose beings, consciousness, and matter. 2,600 years ago, Lao Jia wrote that numbers proceed from the Tao, and that from numbers that all things are born. Quote, the Tao gives birth to one. One gives birth to two. Two gives birth to three. Three gives birth to all things. Lao Jia in Chapter 42 of Tao Te Ching, circa 600 BC. Diogenes Laetius was a biographer of eminent philosophers. The following is his account of 2,500-year-old Pythagorean beliefs. Quote, that the monad, one, was the beginning of everything. From the monad proceeds an indefinite duad, two, which is subordinate to the monad as to its cause. That from the monad and the indefinite duad proceed numbers. And from numbers, signs. And from these last, lines of which plane figures consist. And from plane figures are derived solid bodies. And from solid bodies sensible bodies. End quote. Diogenes Laetius in the Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, circa 225 AD. 1750 years ago, Plotinus developed Neoplatonism, a rich theory concerning the relations between various levels of being. Wikipedia describes Plotinus's chain of being as a series of emanations, the first emanation is new, divine mind, logos, order, thought, reason, from new proceeds the world soul. From the world soul proceeds individual human souls, and finally, matter, at the lowest level of being and thus the least perfected level of the cosmos. Quote. The one is not a being but the generator of being. The greatest, later than the one, must be the intellectual principle, and it must be the second of all existence. For what emanates from the intellectual principle is a reason principle, a logos. And as soon as there is differentiation, number exists. Thus number, the primal and true, is principle and source of actuality to the beings. The soul's substantial existence comes from the intellectual principle. The soul, itself a divine thought and possessing the divine thoughts, or ideas, of all things, contains all things consented within it. This gives the degree in which the cosmos is ensouled, not by a soul belonging to it, but by one present to it, it is mastered not master, not possessor but possessed. This one universe is all bound together in shared experience. So matter is actually a phantasm. Plotinus in the Enneads, 270 AD. 1570 years ago, Proclus wrote that mathematical existence occupies a middle ground. 
he said mathematical being sits between the simple reality that's grounded in itself and the things that move about in matter. Quote, Mathematical being necessarily belongs neither among the first nor among the last and least simple of the kinds of being, but occupies the middle ground between the partless realities, simple, incomposite, and indivisible, and divisible things characterized by every variety of composition and differentiation. The unchangeable, stable, and incontrovertible character of the propositions about it shows that it is superior to the kinds of things that move about in matter. But the discursiveness of, mathematical, procedure, in dealing with its subjects as extended, and its setting up of different prior principles for different objects. These give to mathematical being a rank below that indivisible nature that is completely grounded in itself. Proclus in a commentary on the first book of Euclid's Elements, circa 450 AD. The causeless cause found. Could this be the answer? Could things be so simple? In order for this explanation of existence to be correct, mathematical truth must be causeless. Mathematical existence must depend on neither human minds, nor on physical or material things. In addition, mathematical truth must be something capable of generating observers, observers who consciously perceive their environment, and which they consider as existing physically. Ideally, this causeless cause will illuminate the relation between the mental and material, and explain why the universe obeys simple laws.